Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Napod. Napod features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Napod, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to Napod.xyz if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. My name is Ron, and I'm an alcoholic. Somebody, I should, somebody have a Kleenex? I, somebody have, I'm losing it here. I was hoping one of you guys would throw up your dirty underwear. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> yes, my name is Ron. I'm an alcoholic. Can you hear me all right? If I do this long enough. <laughs> Could a man come up and fix this, please? A real man can handle it. (laughs) Thank you, Kelly. Someone told me when I came in, they said, Kelly was so excited that he finally got me. (laughs) So was I. (laughs) Excuse me. (laughs) I have this cold. Oh, I think it's... I have this cold... And when I walked up to the meeting, I, I was complaining because I came over the mountains. Some of you wish I'd go back. I came over the mountains, and and I can only hear in one ear. And this woman said, well, try blowing. <laughs> That's like asking an alcoholic he wants a refill. <laughs> Don't tempt me. I'm trying to be spiritual here. (laughs) It's really wonderful to be back. Whoever has that little bell, (laughs) please. Um, Yeah, thank you. Um, I don't know. You guys are losing your class here. The last time it was, if you talk too long, Ron, you're going to get a beating. And I talked for seven hours. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Oh, by the way, guys, yes, I am. (laughs) Mm. They always, God help us, they always fucking wonder, you know. Is he really? Get a life. (laughs) Yeah, I'm a real live one. I'm the kind when you walk down the streets in San Diego in your sailor uniform, you take little pictures, you send them home to mother. They see mother, they really do exist. Look at this is a live one. <laughs> and the police didn't even arrest them. It's amazing, California. Mm. And, th- and not only that, I'm living in the Imperial Valley. <laughs> I'm not sure either one of us is ready for that. I'm teaching in the Imperial Valley, and I recently got done teaching, just this week, teaching the novel The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde, <laughs> and um, part of my exam question, they're seniors, and part of my exam, there are several characters, there's Dorian Gray, who's a man who is in love with himself, belongs in this program, and, 
and then there's another guy who's kind of a nice guy as an artist, and then there's another one who's very corrupt and elegant and, and smart and very evil. And so I was just curious, and on the exam question, I, I asked the kids to speculate about which character I fit best as their teacher. <laughs> and I got, you know, well, you fit Dorian Gray, they needed some points because you're beautiful, you know, or, or, you, or you fit this guy because you're an artist, or blah, blah, blah. And one kid wrote, Lady Gwendolyn. <laughs> He'll get an A. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Um, I'm really glad to be back here. It's like a family reunion for me. Um, I see a lot of, of faces I know, and I'm very touched by that. I miss you here. I'm doing my best to reform the Imperial Valley, but it's an uphill struggle. Um, and it's always wonderful to be back home with you people in the North County. Um, oh, oh <laughs> yes, I, I see a couple newcomers here, and they're wondering <laughs> what do they have to go through to get sober. <laughs> I always like to tell them, I'm willing to go to any lengths if you are. <laughs> um, but I do like to um, always, in meetings like this, reassure, reassure those of you who are new, especially, you know, I, I understand um, that straight men sometimes are a little uncomfortable around me until we get intimate. <laughs> I mean in the program. And... I understand that, and so I always try to, if I can, reach out to you and reassure you that, you know, I'm serious about my sobriety, and I always like to hold out the hope of growth in this program, and I always like to, especially to the straight men, tell them seriously that if they're willing to go to any lengths and not drink for 14 years, you can turn out just like me. <laughs> And they all run and call their sponsor and say, I'm not sure I'm ready for this at this point. Um, I was born, um, which is still subject to some debate, in a, in, a little, in a little town in Michigan with a huge star in the sky that is shown over um, the manger. Um, a lot of you know my story. Um, can, you, can you hear me all right? I'm such a delicate little thing in this... <laughs> And this cold has affected my usually macho voice. <laughs> um, I was born in this um, little town in Michigan. And what I always talk about, have talked about for 14 years, still talk about today without a lot of the pain, but with a great deal of joy. Um, as the book says, we don't regret the past, nor do we wish to shut the door on it. We also don't have to wallow, on the, wallow in the past, but we can also look to the past and see just how far we have come. And I have come a long way tonight in uh, September of 1990 from the terrified, lonely, drunken, sick, suicidal, pathological, institutionalized person who stumbled into these doors full of hate and anger and a sense of terrible loss. And I am not in that place tonight. And sometimes, you know, in our stories, it gets so exciting to talk about all the, the bad things and the evil and the dark bars and the lonely, lonely nights and the lonelier mornings that we forget sometimes to remember and dwell on just how wonderful it is to be sober. God knows if you are new, it's worth it. It's worth whatever amount of pain you have to feel. You know, it's worth whatever crashing down of your pride must come to get to a place where you feel some sense of peace and belonging in the world. And that's what I, I like to talk about most, was that I felt as an alcoholic that I never, never belonged. Now, it is my story that I did not belong. There was some reason, I think, for that. 
My father is a fundamentalist Baptist minister. <laughs> and <laughs> I grew up in a family of six farm boys. They couldn't take a joke. <laughs> this is the God's truth. You know, I tell this sometimes, it's the truth. People's eyes, eyebrows go up, but it's the truth. There were ten children in my family. I don't think my father was the best preacher in the world, and he had to fill in the congregation somehow. Those Michigan nights were cold. And he had ten kids, and I was the sixth. Oh, by the way, am I dressed okay? Um, we, <laughs> thank you, thank you. We get this little um, letter. Kelly sends me this little letter with lipstick and perfume all over it. And, <clears throat> and it says, it says, among other things, that I can't talk about. It's a personal letter. But it says, among other things, that this is, you have to dress rather formally. Is that right? At this meeting, kind of formally. And it said, like, men should wear a, a coat and tie, and women should wear a dress. I thought, now where the fuck does that leave me? <laughs> they, ne they never make allowances for something in between, so... I try to cover all bases. I wear my come fuck me boots and my bow tie. Hope that'll cover it all. Um, <clears throat> but I know, you know, I've looked back on that childhood so many years. And I need to talk about this because I need every time to share um, the joy of what it's like today not to be in that place and how this program works. And what I felt growing up was just a total sense of separation from the world. I was never going to fit. I didn't belong anywhere. I was different. And I was. You know, you hear that in, in Alcoholics Anonymous that I always felt different. And I did feel different. You know, I was in a straight community, um, you know, in a religious home. And I talked a little funny. And I walked a little funny. And I was different. And what I remember most was run, wanting to run, was a part of my drinking, a part of my early life, and even into sobriety. I learned how to run, to not face the pain, to not walk through the fear, to not experience anything if I could run. And there was always when I couldn't run, if I couldn't run physically, there was the running up here, there was the fantasies to go to. And I was a voracious reader as a kid. I read novels, Grace Livingston Hill Christian novels. Remember that? I mean, there was always this woman, and she was very poor, and she was very plain, and nobody loved her. And one night she was out walking down the streets of a lonely city like New York or Omaha or Lakeside. <laughs> And it was raining, and it was Christmas, and her shoes were worn out, and she probably had shredded wheat boxes in the bottom of them. And then all at once, this handsome stranger came along, and he fell madly in love with her, and her soul was saved. And then he took her into this beautiful new building, and it was an enchanted barn, and she lived happily ever after, and I wanted a fucking barn. You know? And I didn't want to walk around in shredded wheat boxes anymore, and I would go away in these fantasies. And the other fantasy was, is if I can just hold on long enough, I can get out of here. And one of the reasons that I wanted to get out and to run was that I had a problem that a lot of alcoholics have. Um, I just seemed to feel no love at all. And certainly not any love from my dad. And I think it's important to me um, to trace that in Alcoholics Anonymous. I have inventoried it, I have prayed about it, I have made what amends I think I can make. There are some amends that I haven't been willing to make even at 14 years of sobriety, and some of the pain is still there, but it's better every day. And it was a very difficult time. I don't mean to beat up on my dad. There's nothing more boring than a speaker who stands up here and whines about his parents. But there is an objective truth as well, that it was a lonely, isolated childhood. My father was disturbed about me. He didn't quite know where to put me. And it was all very, very confusing. And so how he responded was to not talk to me and to not have any contact with me, sometimes for months on end, except in anger, 
and in violence. And so I became very, very fearful. I became fearful. I became angry like him. And that's how I lived. And I thought, if I can get out of here before he figures out that I'm not going to marry Susie next door and have seven children and be a Baptist missionary, I've got to get out of town before he figures that. And I joined the United States Navy. <laughs> A couple Marines and sailors here just turned an unbecoming pale white. <laughs> I was defending your country, folks. <laughs> Me against Saddam Hussein. <laughs> Can you imagine it? He'd surrender. <laughs> Send me over there. I'll teach those Arabs a thing or two. <laughs> I'll be begging for mercy when I'm done. Anyway, I joined the Navy. I joined the Navy at 18, um, and my principal reason was the reason that a lot of alcoholic service people have was that it was a chance to run, to get away, to be somewhere else, to be anonymous, to live in the fantasy, to not face reality, to run. And I ran into the Navy, and I ran away, um, and there I stayed for four years. And in that first year, I had an experience with alcohol that changed my life. <laughs> you know, when I was growing up, um, I had a couple of experiences with with beer. Um, I I went on <laughs> I went on this hayride one night in my senior year, and there was this woman named. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Nickert, <laughs> and she was. She was a formidable woman. She was quite well built, and she wore a big 1960s black beehive hairdo, and she wore real thick lipstick, and I was terrified, and she wanted me. <laughs> and she saw me that night on that hay ride, and she came burrowing through the hay after me. <laughs> Oh my God, thank God for beer. I had two bottles of beer and I got terribly ill. <laughs> and she left me alone there, burrowed into the hay. And thank God I preserved the sanctity and chastity of my life. And so it remains today. But anyway, that was just an experience. A lot of us have that. But when I was in my first year in the Navy, I walked into a bar. And I walked in with all that loneliness and all that anger, and all that sense of not belonging, and all around me were the same straight heterosexual men who used to beat me up when I was growing up, and I lived in mortal terror of them, and there they were, and I sat down in that bar and I had a drink, and the world changed. The whole fucking world changed. We cannot ever, ever take lightly here the power of alcohol. You know? If you've lived your whole life in that kind of isolation and anger and fear, and you have a drink, and if for just ten minutes you're taken away somewhere else, and you can be somewhere else, you found a friend. And I found a friend. And in the early stages of my drinking, it was that wonderful time, you know, and we, we hear a lot of, um, of hand-wringing in Alcoholics Anonymous about how awful those times were. What a crock of shit, you know? Why don't we get honest? If they were so fucking awful, why did we stay there for 15, 16, 17 years if it was so terrible? The reason that I stayed out there drinking all those years was because it worked. It took me away. It changed my life. It changed you around me. And it, even if I couldn't then be drunk all the time, and as the years went by, and the drunks lasted shorter and shorter times, and the agony came quicker, and the despair came sooner, there was always that wonderful hope that in the worst goddamn hangover you could possibly have, when your skin crawls and the wall wallpaper moves, and I've been there, there is the hope that tomorrow night it's going to be the night. Tomorrow night I'm going to go out again. I'm going to have that drink. It's going to be beautiful. You're all going to love me. And most of all, it's never going to end. It's a wonderful, wonderful dream. 
We live it in our consciousness every day. And in the worst times of my drinking, there was always that kind of blue light sensation in the back, if I can just do it right. If I can just fix it somehow like it was, I can have that drink and it will work again. It's a wonderful, wonderful place to be if it would have stayed that way. It's a wonderful escape. And we, we, we put alcohol down a lot, and it's my personal opinion as it seemed to be emphasized. <laughs> they always, I notice whenever I come to that meeting, there's a real strong emphasis. This speaker tonight is expressing his personal opinions, you know. Um, they are my personal opinions, and one of my personal opinions is that if I had not found alcohol to take me away from that awful hell that I lived in emotionally, I wouldn't be here tonight. I couldn't have stood it. I couldn't have borne that all those years. It was too awful. I look back now, and I know it was too awful. So alcohol was my friend. It took me away. I joined the service and I served for four years. I was like a lot of alcoholics. I was obsessive about my career. I was terrified again that I was going to be exposed. I was terrified I was going to fail. I was terrified that dad sitting back there at home in the farm back in the country was somehow going to get a call someday from the Navy saying, your kid is queer. And then any chance I ever had of being loved by that man was finished. And I knew that, and I was terrified. So I figured after four years, well, I'll get out of this, you know. They're going to find me out someday, and I'll get out of here. And, and I know what I'll do. I'll go, I'll, I'll go be a, a brilliant college student, and I'll get a great career, and then Dad will love me, and then Dad will care for me. I said, I have to be careful sometimes about this because I notice sometimes when I talk about my dad a little bit, a lot of you ACAs out there, you know, you get in heat. <laughs> you, you see a potential partner <laughs> and you come running up to me after the meeting, you know, with glazed eyes and say, go to ACA. And I go to ACA sometimes and ring my bell there and it helps. Um, but <clears throat> my father and I um, had big problems. And so I got out of the service and I went into college. And we talk a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous about willpower. And that you'll hear sometimes out there, you'll hear people say, my brother has said to me, he's a policeman, he has said to me many times, the only reason you drunks can't handle your drinks, of course, is because you have no willpower. Let me tell you about willpower. I drank in nearly a total blackout drunk. For four years at San Diego State University, I was in a blackout nearly all that time. I was drunk nearly every night when they weren't institutionalizing me, and I came out of that four-year university um, with a degree with honors in my major field and was so blacked out that I have had to go back since then to check out who my professors were and what courses I took because I simply could not remember. I was blacked out. We, we don't know if we have willpower, but we have a sustaining fear that will keep us going through anything because we're afraid if we stop and let go long enough, we will fall apart. And so I kept on. And I got out of the service, or out of the, out of the college, and I did another thing I think that's characteristic of alcoholics, is once you get a, like a diploma or a degree or something like that, you have this mad attack of responsibility. I mean, it's terrifying. Now I've got this degree, now they're going to expect me to do something. And I did. I got a job in a liquor store. <laughs> that's where alcoholics with degrees in English get jobs in liquor stores. Isn't that wonderful to do inventories on your jobs? I always was very careful in my selection of jobs. I always was sure that I was in a job where not much was expected of me. It was near enough to a place where I could walk to work because I knew that I had enough 502s that eventually I was going to lose my fucking license. And also I had to be somewhere where there was alcohol either in the place or across the street. And I worked in those jobs for a number of years. 
And every once in a while I'd have an attack of responsibility and I'd go back and I'd dabble in school or I'd find some responsible job and then I would get drunk and I would wind up um, back in a liquor store um, doing my maintenance drinking. In about that time in 1974, um, I met, um, I was working in a, in a drugstore in downtown San Diego and I walked into a bar one night and I, I met someone. <laughs> um, he was sitting at the bar, kind of looking like Mr. Goodbar, and I was sitting at the bar and I had ten dollars and he was a practicing alcoholic and we were in love. <laughs> Doesn't take much. And we do a lot of um, talk in Alcoholics Anonymous about these relationships. You know how people get together with their sponsors and say, Oh, back in those drinking days, I was in real sick relationships. <laughs> Thank God now for the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. In my recovery, I am now able to have a healthy relationship. <laughs> Watch them walk into the Thursday night workshop. Look how healthy they are. He walks in. She walks in with his best friend having a talk probably about the seventh step or something. And he looks across the room and he says, there she is. Why, the little tramp flirting with somebody else in Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, of course, we say, oh, well, we'll just release with love. <laughs> after we kill each other in Alcoholics Anonymous and apply the steps and make the proper amends. Those sick relationships, <laughs> those sick relationships that we wring our hands about were another thing, if we get real honest, that may have kept us alive. I found someone who is just as sick or maybe sicker than I was, and that was okay because you know what? When I went home at night, he was there. As long as I kept the refrigerator full of alcohol, and as long as I was there with a paycheck on Friday night, he was there. And that mattered. And you know what? It also mattered that he told me he loved me. It doesn't matter, people, as alcoholics, whether it's even true or not. We needed so desperately to hear that, that we would pay any price to hear it. And I did pay any price. And this relationship would break up all the time. And it was breaking up one time. And I was on a blackout drunk and he was gone somewhere. And I was going to go home. And there was one thing that I couldn't do as a practicing alcoholic. And thank God in recovery I can do. Is one thing I absolutely could not do ever was go home alone when I was conscious at all. There was something, no matter where I lived, there was something in that place that was too terrifying to face. And I could go home, if somebody would go home and drink with me into a blackout until I could pass out and not face the room alone. And then they could go or rip me off or do whatever they did and frequently did, but just don't let me go home alone. And so I would pick people up on the street. And I picked some people up this one night and... And I don't remember the next day I woke up and there was all the sleazy evidence, you know, and, and, and I was trying to remember if I had a good time or whether I got cheated. And I looked around at that room and I'd been ripped off and it was a terrible mess. And I thought, you know, I really need to do something about my drinking. This is terrible. I can't stand these hangovers. I'm spending all this money in bars. I'm getting ripped off all the time. I'm getting physically sick. I can't eat. There's something wrong here. And I had a friend who was in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a friend and a relative, an aunt of mine. We were best buddies. We used to drink together all the time. And she'd gone to Alcoholics Anonymous. And whenever I, she'd been in for about six months, and whenever I see her, it was, I don't know what you people do to those newcomers, but they kind of like turn into moonies, you know. Her eyes had that serenity glaze, you know. I think she put drops in their eyes or something in the 12 steps. And she was so happy, and she was so joyous, and she was so free, and I was so sick. And so I called her, and I said, um, I need some help. I'm a mess. And she said, well, I, I think you need to stop drinking. Ron. 
I said, no, no, I don't need to stop drinking, but, but I'm neurotic and I need some help and I need a good psychiatrist and all of this and I probably need some tranquilizers and nobody understands. She said, well, well, why don't you go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous? And I said, well, I'm certainly not going to go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I've heard all about those meetings. Just a bunch of religious fanatics sitting around talking about God and picking their nose and trying to save me. And I'm not going to go. Besides that, if I go in there, I'm a faggot and they'll throw me out. <laughs> and she said, it's awful to hear. She says, oh, well, don't worry about that. This is making, she says, I happen to know that there's a gay meeting of alcoholics. Horrors. <laughs> Sober queers, what are we going to do? <laughs> is it allowed in this state? And I thought, what am I going to do? I had to talk to someone, so I called this guy. She gave me a number, and I called him, and he said, well, we'll go to a meeting. And I went to this meeting. It was down at the old gay center in San Diego. It was the Monday night step study. <laughs> and I walked into that meeting. God, if that didn't get me sober, I can't imagine what would. There they were, about 12 queens and two dykes. <laughs> sitting around in a circle, and there was the queen, uh, my friend Mary Joyce is here tonight, he died, uh, my friend Chuck Haight, some of you know him, he died about three weeks ago, very, very active in um, San Diego, Alcoholics Anonymous, and Chuck was there, and he always wore this huge turquoise fish, I mean, it wasn't just a little jewel, it dangled all the way to his waist, and was this big around, and he was sitting there knitting something in pink and blue for his afghan, for his, um, I don't know, for his chair or whatever, and there were a couple other queens talking about how joyous and free they were, and they didn't have to chase sailors on Harbor Boulevard anymore, thanks to Alcoholics Anonymous. I was oh my God, what have I gotten into? They'll change me here, they'll put me in a machine, I'll be straight, it's all I'm not willing to go to any lengths at all. And there were those dice, you know, glowering at me. So I stayed around <laughs> for about um, 30 days. I want to talk about that for just a minute. It's very important to me always. Maybe more important than the time I actually got sober. I came into Alcoholics Anonymous. I had already been arrested a number of times. <laughs> Yes, I got arrested. It's true. They called it punishment. <laughs> I call it now enabling. <laughs> Those policemen used to stop me on the streets of University Avenue in San Diego and say, if you don't behave, we're going to take you down and throw you into the shore patrol brig. <laughs> Oh, Hans, don't do that, officer, please, please. <laughs> and then I jaywalk and get arrested, so could get thrown into the shore patrol break. But there they all were, and I'd been arrested, and I'd been in, in crazy houses. You people called them crazy houses. I called them centers for emotional redevelopment. They locked me up, and they'd throw me in the corner and shoot my ass full of mellow oil and tof and all and give me a basket to weave and throw me out in the middle of the week. And I'd been through all of that, and I was losing weight, and I was crazy, and I was neurotic, and I was a drunk, and I needed Alcoholics Anonymous. I couldn't maintain my jobs. I couldn't even open the safe in the mornings because my hands shook so badly. And I needed Alcoholics Anonymous. Now surely this guy will get sober. He is in the right place, right? And I wanted what you had. You had some things I wanted. You talked about the fact that you've gotten sober in Alcoholics Anonymous and now your jobs were working okay. And you talked about the fact that you were having relationships, going to the theater with your girlfriends your boyfriends or your whatever friends, you were enjoying life, you had gas in your car, and I wanted those things. And I wanted some respect. And I wanted to feel like I was a human being. And you people had that. And I stayed 30 days and went out and got drunk. Because I didn't have what you, didn't want what you really had was to not drink anymore for any reason. That I did not want. And so if you're new here tonight and you think this is a great place to be, that's a kind of a mysterious sign in the beginning. I can never imagine newcomers coming in and saying, 
Oh, I walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous and I felt at home. I was so, so glad to be here. God damn. You know, 17 years of drinking and depending on alcohol and I come in, look around at all these strange people <laughs> and think I'm going to stay here and not drink for the rest of my life. It was very odd. Um, I didn't want to stay in Alcoholics Anonymous because I did not want to stop drinking. I wanted all the other things. So if you're here tonight and you want to get your girlfriend back, you probably will if you stay sober a little bit. You'll smell a little better. You'll have a little money. You take her in the jack-in-the-box. You're going to be a success. <laughs> you don't have an automobile, you know, some crook in AA will sell you one. No problem. <laughs> oh, by the way, newcomers, I, I hate to, to pull your covers. A couple of you, I'd like to. But actually, I hate to disillusion you here. You know, they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, you can trust everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I was speaking at a convention in San Antonio one time. And I got up and I pissed some people off. I said, you know, I said... You can't trust everyone in Alcoholics Anonymous, and some of us aren't totally well. And this woman said, oh, listen, I go into meetings, and I'll leave my purse right on the chair and walk away for an hour. I know it'll still be there. <laughs> I'm 14 years old, and they don't leave it around me at bed time. <laughs> I mean, I'm not drinking, but I'm not well yet. We're not all honest here. But if that's what you're looking for, is, you know, to get all this shit back together and get your life back together, you may get it. And you may get drunk again if your primary purpose here is not to stay sober and not drink for any reason. And that was not when I came in 1974, my primary purpose. And I went out and I drank again. And I stayed drunk until a night in June of 1976. And I was out on one of those crazy drunks again where I was out where I knew the little blue lights under the bar were going to fix me this time. And I was going to turn on Tammy Wynette and listen to him play Stand By Your Man. And I was never going to sober up again. And I was going to be happy forever. And I was going to reach that wonderful, you know, that little plateau you get to where it's okay and it's never going to change. And I was going to get there and what I was getting in those last couple of years was that terrible nightmare feeling of just being drunk. And where I used to walk into bars and people would be glad to see me in the early years of my drinking because I was witty and charming and all of that. And now I was just a fucking drunk. And they would say things like, you know, you can sit in here, but sit down in the bar and if you cause any trouble, we're going to throw your ass out or call the police. And it wasn't the same. And so I got drunk, and I got ready to go home, and on the way home again, I was not going to go home alone, and I picked up uh, two men on the street. It's a very important part of my story for me. I need always to remember it, every day if I can. And I picked up two people on the street, two men, and I took them home, and I'm a drunk. And I knew I was in trouble, and I knew that I was going to be hurt. And I knew that they were armed. And we are so lonely. There's no, way to, there's no way to evaluate the power of that loneliness and the need to escape it. And I just wanted someone to go with me and to drink with me until I could pass out. And, and they went home with me. And when I came to, of course, again, there was the wrecked apartment and the wrecked life and the battered face. And it was all there again. And that day I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was done drinking. I was done. I didn't care anymore. I didn't care if the lover came back. I really mean that. It was done. It was over. I didn't care if I ever worked again, or I didn't care if I worked every hour of the day. I didn't care if you forced me to be religious. I didn't care if you told me I had to be an atheist. I didn't care if you told me I had to go sit naked on a flagpole. Well, <laughs> I didn't care what you told me as long as you would tell me how not to drink again. And in that meeting, there was someone who'd known me from years past. And he came up to me and he asked me a very strange question, a rhetorical question, and I hope somebody asked it of you if you knew. He came up to me and he said, um, Ron, are you, are you ready to quit drinking? 
And I want to tell him, you know, all the horrible things of my life. I want to tell him about my sad past. I want to tell him about my hopeless future. I want to tell him about how beaten up I was. I want to tell him that I was in terrible financial problems. I wanted to just cry and tell him all mine. I tried to tell him, and he kept saying, you know, are you ready to stop drinking? What a stupid question. I had important things to tell him, you know. My lover was gone. My job was gone. I didn't know how I was going to live. And he kept asking me this silly question. Are you ready to stop drinking? And finally I, I said, yeah, I'm ready to stop drinking. And then he said, well, if you really are, you never again have to feel the way you're feeling today ever, ever again. And the miracle was that I believed him in all of this lack of trust and pain and cynicism and twisted personality, I'd finally found someone that I could trust and believe. The miracle of all of this is that I heard these same things back in 1974, the very same things. People said those things in meetings. Come to these meetings, you never have to feel that way again. Don't drink, take these steps, and you can be sober and free the rest of your life. The difference was that in 1974 I wasn't done and surrendered and I could not hear. And in 1976 I was done and surrendered and I could hear everything. I could hear everything. That is the language of the heart. That is why a psychiatrist, and God bless him, that is why a psychiatrist, the best counselor in the world, the best minister, the most knowledgeable people, get so bewildered that they can't help a recovering alcoholic and yet some drunk down on the street corner who's three days sober can speak to you and invite you to a meeting and you'll stay sober the rest of your life because it is a language of the heart because they've been where I had to go and I trusted them. And I trust this program today. I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. It has not been easy. It has not been easy. I came in here you know, and I, all the anger and all the fear and all the insecurity and the sensitivity and the childishness that we drank with, we bring here. And I brought it to meetings and I came to, you, whatever you told me I would do, I didn't do it happily. And I didn't do it gracefully, but you said go to a meeting every day and so I went. I came and I sat angrily in these chairs and I didn't drink through all kinds of pain and all kinds of fear and I didn't drink no matter what but there will come a point where that's just not enough and I realized about six months sober that I was going to deal with this anger and this fear or I was going to drink again and I think you people were very nice and you know you used to say in meetings you know um People come into these meetings as a place in the big book that talks about walking into a meeting and seeing a, a sea of happy, joyous, and gay faces. <laughs> I certainly did not see that when I walked into Pathfinders in North Park. You know, I saw a bunch of rednecks who wanted to beat me up. <laughs> and that kept me coming back for a long time. <clears throat> and I didn't see all of that love and, and hugging and welcome, and nobody even welcomed me. I was a newcomer. And nobody even welcomed me. I used to sit there. And nobody came over and held my hand and said, It's really nice to have you here. You're the most important person in the room. What a big lie. We always believe that we're the most important person in the room. Every one of us we say that. Nobody did that. But I kept coming back with that fear and anger until finally there came a place where I was going to get honest. Where I was going to go back out and find that relief for pain that I'd always known. And I got up in a meeting one day. And I said, I don't like you people. I don't want to be here. I am afraid of you. You straighten in, I've been afraid of all my life. But I'm not going to leave this program because if I do, I will die. I'm going to stay here no matter what. And then it was like, it all changed. They all changed. They come up to me after the meeting and said, Hey, Ron. What do you think of the Chargers, dude? <laughs> but it was like alcoholics recognize when somebody was done and finished. And then I was willing to surrender. And then my ego was smashed and I said, I need you. 
and I need help no matter what because I don't want to drink. That's the way it's been for 14 years, is I have not wanted to drink no matter what, through the worst possible times, through the worst times of loneliness, through the worst times of confusion, I have not wanted to drink. And today there is an awful lot of joy in my life. Thanks to this program, I went back and got my graduate degree in American literature. I toured France for a year teaching, and I came back and now I'm teaching high school in the Imperial Valley, teaching morals to your children. <laughs> That should make you feel some comfort. I'm having a good time living. I'm having a good time in Alcoholics Anonymous. I do a lot of things. I travel a lot in Mexico. I have a lot of new friends. I have a lot of plans. But deep down inside, my heart is here in Alcoholics Anonymous. It truly is. It is as simple today as it was given to me 13 years ago. When you're done drinking, this program works. If you're done drinking, Ron, Ron, pick up the simple tools of this program. Be willing not to drink for any reason. Pick up these 12 steps and take them to the best of your willingness. And when you don't know, don't drink. And when you do know, don't drink. And when you're down, don't drink. And when you're up and successful, don't drink, no matter what. That still works for me today. When all else fails and all the philosophy about Alcoholics Anonymous and all the debates over the 11th step and who's spiritual and who's not and will we get drunk if we don't do the fourth step in 10 pages or 44 pages and will we get drunk if we haven't finished that ninth step and blah, blah, blah. And I get so confused, and I know people something I can always depend on. If I don't drink, I won't get drunk. I don't drink tonight. I don't want to drink tonight. Drinking is done as a solution for me. And I'll close by just telling you a, a quick story um, that, that's very important to me, and, and I had just reconsidered it recently. In the worst days of my drinking, and I was in therapy, and they were going to lock me up. And the room that I used to drink with was in therapy, too. It was back in the 70s, when I was a little girl. And I was going I was going to therapy, and I felt very suicidal, and they were popping me full of all these tranquilizers. And at that time, I was very closeted and very afraid of being a gay person, and I was very afraid people were going to find out. And my aunt was going to this therapy group, and she told me that in her group there was a young man who was a very gifted and talented teacher of the handicapped. And he was much loved by his students, and much loved by the students' parents because he was able to achieve miracles with those kids, and he was an extremely gifted teacher. And it was in the early 70s, and he was a closeted homosexual, and like me, he was terrified. And she would tell me about the group sessions, and how he would come to those sessions, and he would talk about his fear, and how he couldn't run away from it. And he would tell in the group sessions how he would wake up in the middle of the night, and the fear would come like a demon. And he would get up, and he would run round and round and round the house, trying to get away from the fear, trying to run away from the fear for one more night. And finally, he came back to the group, and he said, I don't think I can outrun the fear anymore. It's getting too close. And shortly after that, the group had word that he tried to outrun the fear one last time, and he finally walked into his bedroom, and he lay down in his bed, and he took some pills, and he finally escaped the fear. And I am so grateful, because I don't have to run like that anymore. And I don't have to hide like that anymore. And I am a good person. And I belong in this world. And I have a place in this world. And I have gifts. And I have things to share. And it's okay. And Alcoholics Anonymous has given me that. The gift of myself back again, just as I am. Flaws and virtues and everything else, I am okay. And if you are new in this program, however you are, you don't have to run anymore. You're okay, just as you are. 
We accept you just as you are. If you're done drinking, we have a place for you. In Alcoholics Anonymous, there is freedom here, and there is joy here, and there is recovery. Fourteen years ago, I wanted very much to die, and again, fourteen years later tonight, I want very much to be in the adventure of life, to live it every day, to feel every single thing I can, to experience it all, and I owe that to Alcoholics Anonymous. I love this program. If you're done drinking, it will work. It's good to be here. I love you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.